um, and stay in touch with their counties. We assist in just having feedback on the ground, so to speak. Nothing better than being in a county and seeing what's going on. It's it's one thing to talk about it in Raleigh, but it's another thing to be on the ground in the county and see what you did as a county. So we tries to assist counties in all areas of there and try to help in many ways. One of the things we do there too is uh, different projects. And one of the things that we've all heard these acronyms we have now that we never heard before just three or four years ago, but like ARPA and opioid settlement, things that are such pressing issues on us. Uh, this is an area in strategic member services where we bring the resources to bear to have staff and be there to help you as you plow through those federal guidelines and the requirements and the reporting requirements that come with it. We have people in place that you can call on at any time to help with that. And plus we coordinate that assistance throughout the state as well as in the opioid settlement. We all know those dollars that came down and now counties are going to receive those over a number of years. We have on staff people there to assist with the administration of those dollars as you make you make the decisions how you're going to utilize them. But we help assure that the county is doing that in the proper manner and help guidance in any way we can. Uh, so we help in a middle, a many ways there. Also, you may have met if you've been to some of our association meetings. We have a, a group of students, MPA students that are now considered fellows. And we're placing them across the state, not only to foster people becoming public servants through uh, management and government, but also to assist counties. So we have now about 11 of those placed in a variety of counties where they're needed, but we're continuing to move them about where they can help. So that's a resource you have can always call upon. But again, these are monies, as you may recall, the General Assembly gave the County Association $10 million to assist with ARPA and what's coming down through ARPA, and that's part of what we're doing there. So I just mentioned those in strategic uh, member services. It's an ongoing process, and we're there to help in so many ways. The, uh, of course, one of the major things that we think of when we think of the association is advocacy and events and training, and I think most of you are participating in those, but to the heart of what we do is advocacy is so much of that. Um, that's your contact in the General Assembly. You may have issues as Columbus County that you have to t communicate directly with your legislators, and I'm sure you do. But there are also issues that are statewide that impact all counties. There are, are also issues that you can't be in Raleigh every day monitoring what the General Assembly is doing. We are there every day in monitoring what the General Assembly is doing. So our mission is to keep you informed as to what's going on. If that bill gets filed that impacts funding you might have in X department, we can let you know about that before it happens. We can keep you posted on what it what's happening. We can also do the studies to determine what implications are for county government and help foster a policy or a, how we're going to pursue that in the General Assembly. And as you know, those who have been around uh, it, uh, the general assembly can move fast and especially at the end of the session and it's mindful to be watchful at that time to see the implications for counties uh, we provide policy expertise your staff can call upon our advocacy group if you need advice or you've read a bill and you don't understand maybe where they're coming from or what it entails uh, we need to hear that I will turn that back, though, and say we need to hear back from you in advocacy as you hear things going on. If you hear communication with your members of the General Assembly, keep us informed because sometimes you hear things maybe at that event on a Saturday that we haven't heard. So it's a, it's a two way and we appreciate any feedback we get about advocacy. So regular communication on legislative developments. I hope all of you are receiving that on a regular basis in your emails of keeping you posted what's going on at the General Assembly. Uh, and that ties into the education and training, as we've seen in the last few years, how much county government changes on a regular basis. It's staying current with what's going on. I will tell you that I think over my years, I'm a retired county manager, 30 years as a manager. But one of the keys to me was education is always learning, always learning how to do it better, always learning uh, from your fellow counties. Don't reinvent the wheel if you can learn it from someone else. Uh, but it's a, but we do offer a variety of educational opportunities from our legislative conference to our annual conference. That's a time for all 100 counties to come together and talk about what's important to them, to each county and what's important to the whole association and set our priorities going forward. But upon, upon, uh, on top of that, we have, I hope, 
you commissioners have the opportunity to go to the essentials program that we do in conjunction with the school of government. And that's an educational program for those who have been coming on the boards, new board members. So, so mindful that. So we have an ongoing effort of education uh, and working with the state and the general assembly to put those together. We have several membership program solutions that we partner with. Some of that you may be aware of those, uh, but that's just something that people where we, they support us in our efforts and uh, they're our partners in serving our, our members. Uh, consultative services, uh, want to touch upon that real quickly. Uh, the, if you, the property tax, we have someone on staff that is a long serving employee of the Department of Revenue. They stay in tune with what's happening in the General Assembly regarding uh, taxes, property tax, as you know, your main source of income. So any changes there can have great implications. We also have our own tax solutions program, which is a software program administered in a number of counties uh, where we partner with our counties to do that. But again, don't have to be a member of that to get the benefits of David Baker, who's on our staff and an expert in property tax as issues may come up. Uh, I've had the honor of being part of your retreat facilitation in the past years. Uh, so we're, we're there to help with that if need be. We know a lot of counties keep that among themselves and have that do that internally, but it is a service we provide uh, and, and one that we are willing to offer. We'll do a number of retreats every spring at budget time. Issues, legal issues. I know staff attorneys often turn to our legal counsel uh, and, and through the attorney association about what's going on within the state. And then finally, recruitment assistance for vacant staff positions. Uh, we've been through that a, a couple of times with, and right now I've got several county manager searches going on and we help with those counties wish our assistance. So that's our consultant services. Research and publications, all those materials you may see and in your uh, handout there, I provided our map book. Some of you may be aware of that. Don't, uh, just wanted to provide you a copy. If you didn't already have one, it sort of gives you statistics of what's going on across our state uh, and how you compare to other counties. But our data goes well beyond that. Uh, in data that you may need. We have uh, Denise Kennedy on staff that can actually, if you tell us a specific thing you want to pursue, she, if she can't find it, maybe she can help locate it for you, data that might be applicable to an issue you're addressing. So please feel free to call us upon that. Uh, and two, we'd like to tell the story of county government and the impact it's having in your communities and also the educational purpose for the citizenry. So we help counties in all that and to tell your stories uh, county uh, lines is one and county quarterly now. I'm going to old school county lines, but county quarterly. Uh, we're always open to any stories you may have of interest you think would might relate to other counties that we can tell that story in our publication. And we're always open to your input there. That is a quick overview of what we do as the association service delivery, but I'm going to recognize Charlie now and that hopefully at the end we'll have a little time for questions. Thank you. I uh, appreciate also the opportunity to speak with you this evening. I'd like to echo Neil's comments and thank you for your participation in the risk pools, uh, which is a separate decision that you make in addition to being a member of the association as well. Uh, just the packets I've given you has gotten more, has more detail about all the programs and services we offer through the risk pools. I'd like to just highlight a few things for you this evening, trying to be considerate of your time. Uh, first of all, just a reminder that the uh, NCACC risk pools were created by the member counties back in the 1980s when the insurance industry decided it did not like local government anymore and decided that it did not want to do your workers' compensation or your law enforcement liability coverage. So out of that necessity, the association created the risk pools. Uh, we actually have two risk pools in place today, one's for workers' compensation coverage the other is for liability and property coverages. We are a self-insured <coughs> retention group. Uh, when you join the um, risk management pools, you are not buying an insurance policy. You're jo joining a full-fledged risk management program that is worked together with your fellow counties. We are governed by a board of county commissioners and county managers. Just like this county is governed by a board, we're governed by a board of your fellow members. We are also administered by association staff. Currently our pool membership, uh, we have 70 of the 100 counties participating in one or both of the 
pools. We are the premier provider of protection for county governments in the state today. We also have 31 county related entities. These are entities whose functions are normally functions that would occur within a county structure, but for some reason they are set up separately on a regional or an individual basis, such as county health departments, regional uh, jails, uh, transit situations like that. Risk pools to be effective and efficient have to be financially responsible. And we take our responsibility very strongly. Uh, to achieve that, we have an annual audit each year by an independent auditor to review each of the pool's financials. We have consistently received favorable audits and have continued to present ourselves and that information is available to every pool member. In addition to that, we also use an outside independent actuarial to come in and review our financial structure to make sure that we are properly reserved with funds to cover the liabilities that our members may have for claims and future claims that may rise down in the future. Currently, we have more than enough adequate reserves to cover all liabilities that are available for, through claims process. We also maintain a reinsurance program. Uh, the reinsurance program is designed to help protect the pool in events of large catastrophes or large losses. Uh, North Carolina occasionally has a little thing called hurricanes show up, and the reinsurance program is very helpful in maintaining the financial strength of the pool and utilizing that program. Just to highlight a few things as far as some risk issues facing North Carolina counties today and our reaction to those, uh, I think probably everybody's a little tired of talking about cyber, but almost as much as COVID, but cyber is, is here. It's going to be here for a while. Uh, staffing issues. A lot of these are operational issues that the counties are facing, but you have to remember that where there's difficulty in operational issues, they also pre present an issue from a risk standpoint, that the county could face some financial potential risk uh, through these situations. Recruitment retention is difficult for everyone. Uh, training of new staff, plus you're losing institutional knowledge and positions that you've had. Uh, we're seeing a rise in employment-related litigation. Uh, emergency services are specifically hit hard these days. Uh, we're in a time of change as far as what society expects of us from an emergency operation standpoint, and those standards are being uh, revealed to us through litigation and lawsuits. Uh, direct injuries continue to rise. We're also seeing a rise in PTSD situations. We also see a lot of vehicle exposures. Um, folks sometimes forget that vehicles are really the, the biggest and leading claim frequency for any county. You think about the number of vehicles you have on the road at any time. You have them 24 seven, they're on the road all the time. Vehicles are your biggest exposures. Continuity planning, whether it's because of a storm or of a cyber event and detention center issues. Uh, we all know that it used to be that Detention centers are really designed to, to house the criminals, but now that whole environment is changing. You're now responsible for mental health issues. You're responsible for addiction tra uh, treatment, uh, and that continues to expand. The stress that puts on your detention and law enforcement staff, how do they respond to that and the litigation situations that arise out of that? A few things that we're doing as your risk pool to try to help counties um, deal with these situations. First and foremost, we develop our own comprehensive coverage design specifically for North Carolina counties. We don't take a boilerplate coverage form from the insurance industry and try to use it for our organizations. Ours is specifically designed just for North Carolina counties. We review that coverage every year with Coverage Council to make sure that we're on track with our legal issues and to make sure it is responding to the members the way we'd like for them to. We have specialized cyber protection for our members. We also provide resources, but we also partner with uh, a lot of organizations. We're very fortunate in North Carolina that the state takes cyber response very seriously. So we're partnering both with the state DIT and the National Guard programs, but also the, the uh, North Carolina Local Government Information Systems Association and their cyber response team in helping counties in their resources. The nice thing about this, all these resources are available to every member for no additional charge. Everything that we're talking about on this page right here 
is included in the program as being a membership. We also offer a web-based training platform referred to as County College. Trying to educate and train your staff is always a challenge. This is available to all your uh, organization. Uh, last year, we provided over 30,000 training videos to our members, and it can be tailored to an individual use by department, countywide. Uh, we mentioned the issue with uh, human uh, resources and retention, retention, recruitment, also employment-related litigation. We offer a human resources helpline. If you have a situation where you have a difficult situation coming up involving an employee, we, you can access uh, an employment lawyer who can advise the county uh, perhaps how to prepare and deal with that situation, uh, again, at no charge. Emergency Management Assistance Program. Most counties have an EAP program, but what we have found is that particularly folks in emergency management are hesitant sometimes to use their in-house EAP. For some reason, they think word will get back and they, they don't want to present themselves as having <clears throat> struggles. We have partnered with an organization that specializes in emergency management uh, issues. It is completely private. It is so private, we don't even know who calls. All we get are numbers. So it's available, again, at no charge. It's available to all your emergency management folks, your law enforcement, your EMS, your 911 center folks. It's available to all of them at no charge. One area that we are stressing and working on very diligently with, diligently with is our partnership with the group Legal Liability Risk Management Institute. This is a law enforcement specialty organization, one of the premier organizations in the country. Uh, we've partnered with them. They're able to provide to our sheriff's offices uh, free resources such as policies and procedures. Uh, also, we have a program called Bridge. It's a video training program that's available to officers. All these programs are available at no charge and are available 24-7 to our uh, law enforcement. One of the things I like to stress the most is we have our own in-house risk control staff. We have four folks who are in the field every day traveling around. Our risk management staff, Neil made a comment about getting out into the counties. We believe that firmly. Our risk management staff averages over 150 in-county visits a month. We're in the counties every day out visiting folks, talking with these issues. And finally, the last thing I'd like to just touch on real quickly is we do have a variety of safety equipment reimbursement programs, soft body armor, bumper guards. We also have uh, guards that go on the lifts for the transit to prevent fall offs and roll offs from those things. And we continue to look at those. We hear feedback from our members about where we can assist them and we try to respond with the resources that we have collectively brought together as a risk pool. I, again, packets you have give you more detail on all those, but I'd like to just kind of stop there and see if there are any questions that you might have for Neil or myself. Any questions? Everybody good? We were too good. Okay, good. <laughs> Thank you all again for giving us the opportunity. We appreciate it very much. Thank you all for driving down and sharing this information with us. We appreciate all you have done for us, officer. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> This time we'll move on to item number 11, presentation, North Carolina Department of Insurance Information. Regional Director, Ms. Yvonne Norris, will present information about the new North Carolina Department of Insurance location in Whiteville. Good evening, Ms. Yvonne. Good evening, and I thank y'all for letting me come today and for the ones of the commissioners and our county manager that went to the open house. Thank you for that. If you've not been, please come to see our new facility. We're at 2 South Madison, the old B and T building down at South Point. Um, I just want to say thank you. This is something big for Columbus County. It's never been. The office was open in Wilmington, and they closed that office, and the commissioner moved it down here. And I would like to say that the commissioner is working for North Carolina to keep our taxes, um, keep our insurance down. And if y'all like I am, mine's going sky high. But he is working, and the commissioner's mission is statement is to promote a stable insurance market through unbiased regulation and to protect the lives and property of every citizen in all 100 counties while fostering superior and user friendly service, courtesy, and respect. And his vision is a lower insurance rate and a solvent insurance market through industry competition and a decline in insurance fraud. 
He also expects representatives of the North Carolina DOI to be knowledgeable, friendly, accessible, and to provide exit service to residents in all 100 counties. Any questions? I just appreciate you, what y'all do in, in choosing Michael, Columbus County, for your headquarters. Thank you. Pass that on to the commissioner. There's a lot of things that he's going to be in Columbus County. I'm the regional director over five counties. I have Scotland, Hope, Robinson, Bladen, and of course, Columbus County. And he will be around and about in Columbus County more. When I know that he's going to be here, I will let y'all know so that y'all can come speak to him okay. and let him know that we appreciate what he does. Thank you. Anything Thank you. else? I think that's got it. Thank you, Ms. Yvonne. Thank you. Good seeing you. <clears throat> I'm number 12, presentation, North Carolina Department of Environmental Quality. Program Manager Rob Emans will conduct a presentation to provide an update on the eradication of the giant salvia from the Gatway Swamp Project. Good evening, Mr. Rob. Hello there. How are you? I'm well, thank you. I hope you are well, too. Doing good. Thanks for having me tonight. Yes, sir. Unless there's any objections, I'd like to do a little show and tell with you. And I have a, uh, a specimen here I'll bring up. Okay. See if I should, can I take this with me or is this locked in here? I don't know what I'm doing. Just gives one I'm moment. I'm confused. Oh, there we go. Uh, is this working okay? Can you hear me? All right. So this is giant salvinia. Uh, I'll, I'll let, let you all look at it and just pass that around. And um, it doesn't look like much there. And why is it called giant salvinia? It's not that big. That's a mature plant right there to call it giant salvinia, right? It's kind of small. Well, there's a, there's a common salvinia, a native salvinia. It gets only a tenth of that size. So that's why it's called giant salvinia. So scientific names can be pretty descriptive. Anyone know the scientific name for poison ivy? Toxicodendron radicans. So that's got a scientific name too. Salvinia molesta. So to give you an idea, a little insight to maybe what this plant can do. This plant is actually one of just a few plants that are the most problematic aquatic weeds in the world. To give you an idea. That's a regulated plant. I need a permit from the Department of, of Agriculture to, uh, to bring that here tonight. So it's, it's not legal to bring into the country. It's regulated by the United States federal government, USDA, and then it's regulated by our state too. So it's illegal to sell, move around, uh, propagate, et cetera. Unfortunately for Columbus County and North Carolina, it showed up in our state and, uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about this project. And there's kind of a lot to go over, so I'll go over it quickly. There's a partnership, and I'm, and I'm going to kind of try to keep a, a 10,000 foot you know, overview of this and not get into details, but I'll have a little bit of time for questions at the end. So there's a partnership between NCDQ, Columbus County, and Army Corps of Engineers on this project. It showed up in Columbus County, it showed up over in Gatway Swamp, which if you don't know where that is in the county, I've got a circle there showing you. It's over by uh, Cherry Grove. So when you look at a map, some maps might show these ponds. There's two ponds that this, this plant has been able to get into. And uh, when I could go, for, it's not, there it is, okay. So sometimes so you see a map and it shows the ponds like this, blue water ponds. You know, you think of a typical pond, you know, it's open water, it's got a shoreline, maybe could boat, boat around out there. This is a little bit misleading though, because these ponds are actually not much open water. This is a little tricky. Let's see if I can, it's kind of going on my screen here, but it's not going on the projector. I might need some technical assistance. See if you can get that up on the on the screen there for me. So what the deal is with these ponds, now you can see it. There's very little open water. The black right up here, that's 
down at the dam of Richardson Pond, you can see this. Anywhere it's black, that's open water. Anywhere it's not black is vegetation. So if you're all out here in the audience too, what I'm talking about here, this black water right here, this is open water. There's a dam here. There's a second pond right here called Buffkin Pond. There's no open water in Buffkin Pond. Buffkin Pond is completely vegetated, partly with giant salvinia. That's this kind of copper color right here down by the dam. The lower end of Buffkin Pond is covered with giant salvinia. And in 2020 is when I first heard that there's giant salvinia again in our state. We dealt with it once before about 10 years ago in Pender County, 15 acre site. It took several years for us to get rid of it, but we did get rid of it. Now it showed up again. And this time it's in a bigger system, more difficult to, to, to deal with. So this is what I came upon summer of 2020. The pond was completely covered with giant salvinia. There was no open water. Uh, and you can see the site too, how difficult it is to kind of get around out because of all these cypress trees. It's a, basically like a hardwood swamp, more than a pond. So what do we start to do? Well, this is, this is pretty alarming, you know, for giant salvinia to show up in our state because it can cause major problems for us. It can lead to flooding. It can foul up your intakes for agriculture or municipal waters. It can, uh, you know, in, in pair waters so that, you know, you can't use it for recreation. It impacts navigation. Um, not to mention, you know, all kinds of ecological impacts as well. So we got going right away on this and we thought, well, the first thing we need to do is get a public awareness campaign going and let people know what's going on, connect with the community, let them know what they have in their backyard so that people know that they, they shouldn't be taking this plant around with them. You know, we don't want to, we don't want it to move any more than it's already moved. We needed to deal, we needed to delineate the infestation. That means just get a better idea of where, where the area is that this plant is and where it's not. So, you know, delineate means just like not a, just a straight line, but a wiggly run, you know, a more accurate wiggly run, line around exactly where it is. So we did that through, you know, just ground, people on the ground looking at the different places where we could get to. And we also sent uh, some folks out there with drones and they did a sur aerial survey. So that was all good. We did that and um, in the fall, we had a public meeting. Um, we pursued some grant money. Let's move on. So 2021, we didn't have a lot of time in, in, in 2020 to do much, you know, because it was only in the summer of 2020 that I first, you know, realized it was a problem and it was here. So. We, we started to get some things ready, and by the by this weed season of 21, um, you know, we had some things in place. We were able to get out there. We had a, an agreement with the county, an MOA in place to cost share, because the state program needs a, a, a match for the money. We, we pull out of a, a fund called the Aquatic Weed Fund, but unfortunately, you know, that requires a, a $1 match for every dollar out of the fund, so. Um, we started to treat Richardson Pond. We treated the lower area because we needed to stop it spreading. And it, was, and it spreads downstream. It's a floating fern. Uh, you think of duckweed or maybe water hyacinth, you know, other plants that are floating plants. It's, you know, it just blows around. The wind blows it. Or if the water is moving, it just moves it down. So right away, we needed to start treating down because we don't want it to go any further downstream and, you know, infest even more acres. So we were successful in doing that. The Army Corps got involved. I'll talk a little bit more about that, the uh, salvinia weevils, it's a biocontrol insect. Uh, I'm gonna go through a series of pictures. I'm gonna go through them kind of fast here. This is from Richardson Pond, looking out from the dam there. Uh, the date is up in that black box. So again, this is fall 2020. Here's June 21. We started the application of herbicides out there. That's why all the salvinia is, is this color, browning, you know, copper colored. It's already starting to, uh, uh, you know, become, it's, it's basically succumbing to the herbicide pressure. It's in-water treatment. Uh, this is, you know, late August. You can see already a lot of the salvinia is cleaned up down there. You can see some, some of the salvinia is kind of black color where it's dying. Let's see. Up in here, you'll see some more of that. There is a lot of that going on, you know, with a large in-water treatment. Uh-oh. 
Why does it freeze on me? I'm showing, I got one picture looking at one picture. You guys are looking at a different picture. Technical assistance, please. What am I doing wrong? You see it's on the screen? This doesn't match the, oh, there it goes. Yeah. There we go. That was a picture I was trying to show you. So yeah, see like all this black here, that's Salvinia that's dying. And it takes a little while for it to decompose, but it, it, when it decomposes, it falls out of the, off the surface and just, you know, it'll just decompose down on the bottom is what's happening to all this uh, vegetation. There's late summer. This is, you know, September 23rd. <clears throat> Again, you can see more Salvinia there, but it's, you know, it's decomposing. So that was, that was the first year of really getting herbicide out there. We didn't treat the whole site. We only treated about 50 acres, but we were successful in keeping it from spreading any further downstream. So move on to 22. Here the goal, now the goal was a little bit different in 22. We're really gearing up now, it's kind of starting this eradication effort. So it's a much broader you know, application of herbicide. Now we're, we're shooting for 115 acres were treated. Um, both ponds now, not only Richardson Pond, but Buffkin Pond as well. Uh, there was also quite a bit of work out there, of just clearing work, because it's so difficult to access this site. We needed folks to go out there in an airboat and take down some of the trees and open up some of the paths just for us to be able to get to the different areas to start applying herbicides to control the salvinia. We also released some more salvinia weevils. Uh, same, you know, another set of pictures looking from the same spot. This is again the uh, boat ramp there, the dam at Richardson Pond. So, you know, this is now 22. This is May. Looks the same as it did, you know, the fall before. Uh, but then the continued herbicide pressure down there. You can see a lot of, you know, si giant salvinia that's black there. It's dead. It's decomposing. By the end of the summer, it's you know looking much better. It's starting to clear up much more. Uh, Buffkin Pond, Buffkin Pond. There's there's not a boat ramp there. It's extremely difficult to access Buffkin Pond. That's the one spot that we uh, we were able to access it from. The landowner uh, said that we could use this spot. It's there's a it's basically right by the old dam. Uh, the dam's been bre breached for uh, several years. Uh, so you can't control the water out there now that just, you know, just flows through the, the uh, breach dam. Um, so we started just to do foliar application herbicide there, just to try to open that up more and make paths. And the contractor went out. Oh, no, you guys are stuck again on that. Oh my goodness. Come on. I don't know why it doesn't go. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> I'm talking, and I, I, I think you say you're seeing what I'm seeing, but you're not. <clears throat> I talk about the uh, Salvinia weevils. It's a tiny little insect. There's, uh, you, can, you can see them with a the naked eye, but just barely, the adults. Uh, the Army Corps of Engineers, they have this uh, program, and uh, it's a biocontrol program for aquatic vegetation management. So giant salvinia is not the only uh, you know, noxious weed. That's kind of a, a uh, legal term uh, for these regulated plants. They call them noxious, noxious weeds. So giant salvinia is a noxious aquatic weed. But the, so the Army Corps, they found this biocontrol insect, it's a weevil that works well on giant salvinia. And the whole, the whole deal there with, with uh, biocontrol insects is you find an insect that is host specific. So it's gonna, it's gonna eat the plant or you know, it's gonna live on that plant that's just that species. It's not gonna impact the other plants, it's host specific. So they, they go through you know years of 
of testing before they start letting these biocontrol insects out. And giant salvinia, fortunately, we have a biocontrol insect, but the weevil is not going to get rid of the plant. It's it kind of it kind of is like its own demise, you know. If it if it eats all the cell, <laughs> if if you're the insect and you eat all the food, then then you know, and and you have eggs out there, you know, what what's left for them, right? So what happens is it goes into this balance where it, it gets the the salvinia, the you know, the target or the I guess the the prey in this in this sense, the food down to low levels, but it won't get rid of it completely because you know it's kind of got this built-in mechanism where it you know it needs still to have some out there so that its eggs you know will hatch and the larvae will have something to eat and you know continue with with its life cycle. It. Oh, that's this. That's a, finally where I was getting to. That's Buffkin Pond. That's where I was saying uh, you know there was herbicide spraying trying to open that area up and all out there to try, try to make a path out there just so we can get out there to uh, get the giant salvinia treated. So, um, you know, again, this was a contractor that came out and did this work. Mr. Evans, I want to thank you for bringing this information. I love what you've presented to show how effective becoming aware of the issues and these evasive species and how y'all take care of them. I know these commissioners are probably interested in any community members that might become aware whether they have an evasive species, points of contact. That way we could provide that to the community. Would there be anything else for this evening? Yes, I have. If I can get to just a final slide. Uh, there's, a, there's a slide that you, that you can stop at right there um, with the financials, just to give you an idea, because this is the first time I actually have given the, the okay. commissioners an update on this project. So I, I didn't know how familiar you are with, with the project and the history of it. But I wanted to really kind of end on this slide because this shows you, and it's a little busy slide, but uh, so here is, is the money that was spent so far. Um, these numbers here, this was an MOA that was in place between the county and the and the Department of Environmental Quality in 21, and then again in 22, um, those MOAs, you know, they each expired now. Uh, these were actuals as far as money spent on the project. Uh, it, it was a cost share, so you can see there's, you know, there's an even split there. Uh, there was also some money, uh, which this was an estimated amount. I didn't get these numbers from the from the core, but uh, just knowing how much time they spent out there, um, these were some numbers I came up with just to give you an idea of their involvement. And then in the red box down here at the bottom, this is looking forward uh, and uh, you know proposed budget for this year and then looking forward to uh, what we might expect in 24 as well. So I'll leave you, I'll leave you with those. And if there's any other questions. Any questions? If uh, you have a budget request, just give it to Mr. Howard Wallace, and I'm sure he'll give it to us. And uh, we'll go from there. How about that? All right. That sounds good. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate what you're doing for us. Is it a danger if someone touches it? It's not. No. Okay. No, it's it's uh, not dangerous to us uh, directly. Just it's, it's uh, extremely invasive. And you know, this stuff... So what happened, it, it doubles its biomass in like two weeks. So it went from, we didn't know we had it until you know, two, two years later. It seemed like it covered 100 acres. Right. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Roth. Uh, item 13, Attorney's Office. Approval of a resolution reflecting the Attorney General update Staff Attorney Ms. Amanda Prince requests an approval for a resolution authorizing execution of opioid settlements and approving the supplemental agreement for additional funds between the state of North Carolina and local governments on proceeds relating to the settlement of opioid litigation. Ms. May, you have anything you want to say? Um. Not really. This just authorizes the county manager to sign off on the MOA for the second round of opioid funding. I so, move it be approved. I motion by Commissioner Bird. Second. Second by Commissioner Featherson. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carried. Thank you, ma'am.
Item number 14, attorney's office approval of the resolution for interlocal agreements. Staff attorney Amanda Prince requests approval of the interlocal agreements for building inspectors in Tabor City, Fairbluff, and Sarah Gordon. Move it be approved. I have a motion by Commissioner Bird. Second. Second. Second by Commissioner Floyd. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carried. 15. Opioid Settlements. Bureau of Justice Assistance. Grant proposal. Ms. Cynthia Sid Wilford is requesting approval to apply a BGA grant in order to fund the planning for a shared adult drug court with Bladen County. Miss Sid here tonight. She's she's nice. not with us this evening. No, sir. Okay. <clears throat> I have a motion to approve. Make a motion to approve. Motion by Commissioner Coleman. Second. Second. Second by Commissioner Bird. All in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, <clears throat> Any discussion? Any opposed? Motion carried. Item number 16. DSS monthly update. Mr. Algernon McKenzie will present. Monthly social services update. How are you tonight, sir? Good evening, Mr. Chairman, gentlemen, Ms. Featherson, <clears throat> Ms. Prince, Ms. Neely. Hope that you have had an opportunity to look at the monthly admin update for social services. If you have any particular questions, I will try to answer those if I can. Tonight, I just want to highlight a couple of things. The first thing I want to just highlight and just to remind you of that this month of February is the final month of the food nutrition emergency allotments that have been given for the past three years. They will end this month. Those individuals who are getting those $95 or more allotments have gotten them or they will have them by the end of this week. As of March 1st, they will no longer be receiving those allotments of $95 or greater. So the state did send out a press release. We have communicated with some of our partners. We do have a list of food banks for individuals who might be interested in that because what we suspect is that it's going to increase the demand for um, food for those local food banks that are supplying those foods also could possibly affect the WIC programs. Um, I think that probably the biggest population that it will affect the most will be our senior citizens who, if they were getting $23, they will go back to that from, I think it's around $181 or more. They will go back from that amount back down to the regular $23 for that size for that allotment. So just want you to be aware of that. That will happen um, March 1st. They will not get those allotments. They will go back to their regular amount of food nutrition benefits as of March 1st. The other thing that I wanted to highlight, and I included it in your board packets, was the North Carolina Association of County Directors of of social services each year develops legislative priorities that they submit to the General Assembly when they are in session, when they are preparing for the budget. And so I included for you tonight um, a list of the priorities that our association came up with. Um, and th these were shared with the General Assembly as they were are preparing the budget. And of course, one of the, the major things that we talked about in there were three major priorities. One of them has to do with adequate funding and programs and placements for those children that we are working with in child welfare that have um, that are hard to place and have multiple mental health and behavioral issues. So they listed some of the suggestions that they asked the General Assembly to consider, and that's priority number one. Priority number two has to do with um, to enhance and to require local management entity, entity and the management care organizations, our LME MCOs, to provide mental health services for adults, which the local DSS agencies have statutory guardianship responsibility. 
And of course, this includes um, all of the adults that we serve with severe needs, such as intellectual disability disorders, developmental disability disorders, severe um, and persistent mental illness, traumatic brain injuries, and substance use disorders. We are statutorily required to provide services and to become guardians um, for those individuals who do not have guardians or, or in need of a guardian to make decisions for them. And oftentimes um, there, are, there are issues with getting services or placements for those individuals. We are seeing a whole lot more individuals that have these problems. The old population that was the older adults, they are younger that have these kinds of problems. So we're just advocating for more services um, for that adult population because we are seeing um, severe mental health disabilities and disorders for individuals that are younger than they traditionally used to be. Um, the last thing is priority number three, which is to fully fund and support efforts to assist counties in the implementation of Medicaid expansion which we all know is in the process of happening as it has moved um, into the house, through the house, and it was voted on favorably. And so we were advocating for funding to help implement that program if that program is implemented. And if you have had opportunity to, to look at that bill, I have not looked at all of it, but we are discussing that and how it's going to affect local counties. There is funding in there for um, the implementation of Medicaid expansion. Um, not sure exactly how that money is going to filter down. There was an additional $50 million added um, after the first bill. There was an additional $50 million added to help with the implementation. Part of that also will include services for inmates, but I'm not sure how that is going to trickle down. But as we get closer to it, I'm sure that we'll have a lot of conversations and we'll be talking about how Medicaid expansion is going to work. But what we do know is that it's going to bring a whole lot more individuals to the table to receive Medicaid, medical benefits. It's going to increase the number of cases that we have in the county as well as the state. It's going to require more work um, the, the state is committed, and in that bill, there is funding to look at infrastructure, to also look at technology to implement this program. They have entertained the idea of some types of automated eligibility for those um, applications that come through the federal marketplace um, for those individuals who are already receiving um, family planning services that could possibly be eligible to make them eligible without us having to touch those cases. But we know that that's going to take some time to implement. We know that with our NCFAS system already, that there are glitches and with that system. So it will be great if they are able to implement that and improve that technology so that some of those applications can be auto approved and that we won't have to touch them but you're talking about what they predict over 600,000 for the state of North Carolina. And if half of those could potentially already be made eligible, then you still have another 300,000 that will possibly apply for Medicaid or be eligible for full services for Medicaid. So we're keeping an eye on that bill. Um, we are talking about that as an association. Um, I will be attending a meeting later this week um, and I'm sure the uh, Eastern Regional Directors Meeting, and I'm sure that that will be the hot topic, is Medicaid expansion. So we will try to keep you updated on that as to how it moves along, as well as how it's going to potentially affect us here in the county in terms of the number of individuals, the possibility of space, the possibility of staff as well. Um, and with that, I'm going to quit. Do you have any particular questions? Mr. McKenzie, we thank you for all you do. Thank you, Appreciate sir. the update. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, sir. I'm number 17, Sheriff's Department. Grant update. Sheriff Bill Rogers will give us an update on grant funds associated with the Sheriff's Department. 
and I believe Mr. Bill Rogers is back there and Mr. Brown McMillan. <clears throat> how are y'all tonight? On behalf of the Government Highway Safety Program, as you're all aware, that there was funding back in October of 22 as far as grant money that was taken from our Columbus County Sheriff's Department. We're happy to announce that the uh, Department of Transportation has um, sent us a letter in regards to that grant money. I'd like to read you this. It's delivered to uh, Sheriff Rogers. Thank you for taking the time to speak with me and my colleagues on February 3rd, 2023, regarding the steps you have taken as the newly appointed Sheriff of Columbus County to bring the office into compliance with the North Carolina Governor's Highway Safety Program's Agreement of Conditions. After speaking with you and Chief Deputy McMillan, we were encouraged by the steps you and your office have taken over the last month to address concerns raised in my October 14, 22 letter suspending the federal physical year 2023 Governor's Highway Safety Program grant to the Columbus County Sheriff's Office. In addition to Chief McMillan, I understand that you have hired at least 12 additional personnel and engaged the services of an individual focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion. You also describe efforts to review and update sheriff's office policies and require supplemental training for all employees on the best practices for fair and responsible policy. These are all important steps toward building a strong and successful workplace engaging in the community you serve. So in the short term, we've gotten our grant money back that was suspended back in 2022, and it was over $400,000 at this time. That we receive. We also are being told that we will be receiving any type of grant that we apply for if we if we can get it in the future. Sheriff Rogers. And the governor's uh, crime control grant also was reinstated. I think it's around thirty thousand maybe, but they reinstated mm -hmm. also. So those grants were reinstated too. And also we had Miss, I think you called for Bladen County, Miss Weeford. She came down Friday and met with us at our detention uh, center. We're also, we're looking hopefully that we can get like $750,000 for our detention center if we uh, if we apply and if we get it. So the grant money is there. We just have to reach out and, and try to uh, hopefully, you know, that we can get this grant money. But as of now, the uh, lift, the ban has been lifted off of us. So we can now start back receiving the uh, the grant money. That's good. I'm proud of y'all. I'd like to say thank you. That $400,000 would do a lot for our county. I would also encourage that we also get that training for that diversity inclusion person. Yes, ma'am. Make sure she's trained. Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We well, thank you for what you're doing. I'm number 18, finance. Finance Director Ms. Lacey Jacobs will present the monthly finance update for January and is requesting approval. Good evening, Ms. Lacey. Good evening. How are you all? Yeah, good. All right. We are on the financial report for January 31st. So we, we tried to make it a little bigger this month so you're able to you. see it. <laughs> um, so starting on the first page, you'll see the revenues. And just as a reminder, these first two pages are the general fund, and that is the annual operating budget. So this is everything we operate on throughout the year outside of your project account, special project accounts. Um, a couple of things that I want to highlight, we are, so this is through January 31st, 58.3% of the year so as we're looking through revenues and expenditures you'll want you'll want to see something close to that um, remember that several um, revenue lines are they do lag a couple of months behind um, simply because those are reimbursable type grants i wanted to highlight sales tax specifically you will see that that's lagging um, more than usual so 
during COVID, we saw a an increase in sales tax simply because folks were shopping local. Um, they were shopping local. They were shopping online. So as people are getting out, as people are going to other counties, they're doing their shopping elsewhere. So encourage your your friends and family to shop local. Um, we will see that directly in our budget as far as sales tax goes. Um, a couple of things, miscellaneous revenue, you'll see that's a little higher than normal, than budgeted, um, which is a good thing. Um, we that is that increase is primarily related to interest related to um, grants that we have. So if you move, move into the next page on the expenditure side, of course, you have your few that are um, higher one time, your administration and personnel. Um, we will also see several um, funding sources come through. This is the second page, the expenditure page to me is sometimes more important than that first page. We want to make sure that our expenditures never out, out, outpace those revenues that are on the first page. So you will see um, the revenues, we are at 56.66%, and then the total general fund expenditures, we're at 50.66%, uh, which is uh, a net revenue, a net income as at $4.4 million. All right, and if you go to the third page, you'll see those specific project accounts um, that you typically see each month, all the water districts broken out. Um, and if you keep flipping all the way to the back, you will notice that your fund balance percentage hasn't changed month over month. So that's a great, a great thing. I also wanted to highlight, um, we have been working very hard with all the departments on the budget process. Uh, we created budget binders this year to make sure that it was very organized. And we pushed out those last week to the, um, all the different departments. That information, we, we sent it electronic and hard copy. Um, we are asking those departments to come back to us with their information by March 10th. So we're, um, we have, we have met with some departments. They've invited us to some budget retreats. They've had, um, they are all doing a very good job at really getting in the details on what their expected revenues are as well as their expenditures. So I've been very pleased and very um, impressed with all the knowledge that the departments have on the budget. Um, just as a reminder, the planning retreat for you all is March 8th. Um, and then I also wanted to mention, so <clears throat> we have a resource team at our disposal um, with the Local Government Commission. They have representatives in each region that assist with um, any entities that are on the UAL. So one of the first things that I did whenever I arrived um, back in November was I contacted our um, regional representative. So she has actually come twice. Um, she's met with a couple, myself and a couple of other folks in the finance office. And um, this past time, she came last week and she, we continued to talk through good practices and uh, best practices and research. And while we're stream, trying to streamline some of our business processes, she's, she is a former um, finance director for a county. So she's given us, you know, her her experience and what she's done in the past, as well as lo what the local government commission expects out of us. So she did review our budget process, and we showed her every, all the documentation that we hand over, um, and and the timeline that we follow, the departmental meetings um, that we have, and she was very impressed too. So um, it was great to get that good feedback from her. Um, knowing that she'll be she'll be on the um, other side of it whenever we we go to them and have to submit our budget early to them um, in May. So with that, if you have any questions as, as it relates to the finance report, I'm happy to happy to answer them. Any questions? Okay. Mr. Chairman, I have a motion. To I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go right ahead. Oh. Do we have a motion to approve the finance update? I have a motion to approve. I have a motion by Commissioner Coleman. Second. Second. Second by Commissioner Featherson. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carried. Item number 19, finance budget amendments. Ms. Lacey Jacobs has three budget amendments that she'd like to go over with. 
I sure do. So all three of these include additional revenues. So anytime there are additional revenues that change the bottom line of the budget, um, you all will approve that budget amendment. Um, the first being supplemental funding for DSS for food stamps. Um, that came in at $68,141. Um, and it's additional funding through SNAP ARPA. The second one is uh, Columbus County Solid Waste. So their L LCID operations. Um, in order to balance the budget for this year, um, that is increasing the revenues by $150,000. The third one is related to the governor's highway safety grant. And this was a reimbursement that we, um, we were able to call in from the funding um, previous to the suspension of the funding. So this $34,517 was related to the governor highway safety grant um, from prior to October. Okay, we have a motion to approve the three budget amendments. So moved. Item number 19, have a motion by Commissioner Bird. Second. Second. Second by Commissioner Floyd. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any discussion? Any opposed? Motion carried. Thank you, Miss Lacey. Thank you. Appreciate what you do. Item number 20, administration approval of relocation. Mr. Eddie Madden is requesting approval of some interdepartmental units with the, within the sheriff's department to relocate mr Matt. yes sir uh, the sheriff of course can help me with this item but as you're aware uh the plans are to uh, construct a new sheriff's department uh, in the near future we're working with the architectural committee uh, along with the consultants on that project in the meantime uh, we have to relocate staff from the present building to other county-owned properties uh, to make make way for normal operations for the sheriff's uh, employees. Uh, we have identified three sites. One is currently the uh, board of it, the former board of education building, uh, which this board is aware of, uh, that would be the primary office of the sheriff. Uh, in addition to that, the uh, former board of elections office, 50 Legion Drive, that you all are quite familiar with as well, uh, has been made available to the sheriff. Uh, that space seems to accommodate the, the needs for his patrol division. Yes. And then the third is uh, the former offices of emergency services uh, directly behind the health department that some of his staff would utilize as well. I didn't want to give authorization uh, without the board's knowledge of that uh, and would actually prefer you all to be on the record approving the use of the space by the sheriff's department. I move we approve it. I have a motion by Commissioner Bird. Second. Second. Second by Commissioner Floyd. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carried. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Sheriff Rogers. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Madden. Yes, sir. Item number 21. Appointments, reappointments, replacement. Staff is requesting appointments, reappointments, or replacement to the following boards, committees, or councils. Moving on to the literary council committee. Entire board appointment, Mr. Drone McMillan was on that appointment. Uh, Ms. Commissioner Barbara Featherson has agreed to take that appointment. So do we have a motion to so move? I have a motion by Commissioner Bird, second, second by Commissioner Coleman. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carried. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Recess regular session and enter into Columbus County Water and sewer districts one, two, three, four, and five mm -hmm. board meetings. Do we hear a motion to approve? Make a motion. Have a motion by Commissioner Floyd. Second by Second. Commissioner Coleman. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carried. I'm 22. Water and sewer districts one, two, three, four, and five. Approval of the following meeting minutes, which is February 6, 2023. We hear a motion. Make a motion to approve. I have a motion by Commissioner Coleman. Second, second. by Commissioner Featherson. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carried. I have a motion to adjourn combination meeting of Clemens County Water and Sewer Districts, one, two, three, four, and five board meetings. So moved. I have a motion by Commissioner Bird. Second. Second. Second by Commissioner Floyd. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carried. Moving out this time, we'll 
and Commissioner Berg for Commissioner comments. <clears throat> Mr. Nobles, I'm getting a lot of calls with individuals down one in the eastern end um, on the uh, District 4 with the water on what areas we're actually going to be serving. I've had several customers to, or potential customers that want the water to know if they're going to get it. Um, are there any way that we could identify the actual areas that we're going to be um, adding water lines to, and especially the Money Hole Road? I've had several individuals in there to call me. We, we have some, but the uh, deed determination is going to be on customer sign ups and then the deed use plan. But that's what I'm saying. I'm not, they're not sure. Do they need to sign up? Now, one gentleman called me the other day and said he had signed up 17 years ago. But he's not sure where he's getting it now in this phase or not. So what I was saying, do we have any way to really identify the areas that it's going to be offered? That that's what I'm saying. I think we would get more participation with some others that don't know. So we got two projects going on. Um, one is the EDA project, and so we do know what roads we're going on, and that is um, Money Hole. A portion of 74, 74. And, and Oscar Blanks. Do we have some way of putting that out so people can determine where they live and how it's going to affect them? Yes, I think that would help us a whole lot. We'll and, right. Okay, I'll rest tonight with that, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner Burke. <coughs> Commissioner Cole. I'd like to uh, ask for the community and, and citizens of Columbus County, if you can, uh, our EMS and rescue need volunteers, and uh, if there's any way in the world civilians out yonder can can step up and, and volunteer for some of these positions in there, it'll help us the county out tremendously. We had a meeting with the EMS chiefs the other day, and uh, they they were I'd say desperately maybe that's the wrong word I'm looking for, but they were urgently asking. Uh, and thinking of some way to try to get volunteers to join back up with the uh, rescue squads and EMS services as, as volunteers and fire and rescue. And I think it'd be a, a good thing to do that. And, and I'm asking employers if they can, and they can spare their people to uh, get them to help volunteer and to uh, serve our county because it's a much needed process. A lot of times it's thankless, but it is something that's needed. And I'd encourage and ask if people would try to get back into volunteering and, and helping the county out. Because, uh, volunteer work is thankless, but it is a necessary part of our community. And I'd also like to thank uh, the uh, employers and our employees of, of our county. I've heard a lot of good things uh, coming out by people that are just manangering around and looking and listening. Uh, they're, they're getting more uh, satisfied and, and things are starting to settle down more. And I think we're looking to have a good rest of the year, and I'm hoping. That, and with the water coming and the Internet, uh, I think it's going to help us out a lot. That's all I got. Thanks, sir. Commissioner Floyd. I'm good now. Good. Thank you. Commissioner Feathers. Right. <clears throat> As Sheriff Rogers, um, it, it, are there times in which areas of the county is not covered uh, with deputies? And if so, what are those times? I had someone to call me on last, I think it was on last Wednesday night. They called the Sheriff's Department for assistance because uh, they were getting an unknown person knocking at their door saying they needed help. <clears throat> And they called the sheriff's department and they were told that there was no coverage in that area at that time. So is, is there a time? Uh-huh. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Okay. Okay. That I'll, that did occur on last week. Um, and 
All right. Thank you. Thank you. Also, I'd like to say um, this is Black History Month. I am Black <laughs> and I am history. Uh, the first Black African American to sit on this board. Uh, I'm here as a result of the forerunners, and I'd like to acknowledge and recognize Mr. Harold Troy, who still lives here in Whiteville. He was one of the individuals that was instrumental in getting District 1 established. Mr. Harold Troy. Mr. Chairman, can I say one other comment? Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Rogers. When, you know, if you, uh, on your idle time, when you're looking through Facebook and you see all these videos being shown with police officers doing their job, but an individual says, well, I don't have to show you my ID. I don't have to do this. I don't have to do anything. Tell me what crime I've committed, you know, and a lot of times watching them, someone's called because it's a, just like she's saying, someone knocking on their door or someone just sitting in front of their house or whatever, are there anything that we could do maybe through the state of North Carolina to get it? So if you do approach someone, they do must show you their ID and comply with some, you know, they'll, they'll, if you, you ever watched any of them. But in charge if they don't in, in in many instances so they just flat refuse them and cuss the officer out and the officer the two or three of them there they want to see their supervisor and all this kind of stuff and and for our younger generation sitting watching that and, you know, well, anyone uh, that wants to be contrary, and that's what's causing a lot of our problems with the police. I mean, on one I watched last night, I mean, he just talked awful to that officer over and over and over and called him all kind of names and all. He still stayed calm and done his job, but that's what escalates situations where people get hurt. You know, and, and I think it's only right if you – if I'm somewhere other than on, in my own yard that you and somebody's called and an officer's arrived, I should have to show them my ID to show I had a right there or whatever. I think that's only fair. Thank you, sir. And he'll work on that. <laughs> 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 yeah, but I mean, it is something we need to look at. It is. Uh, I had the opportunity to tour the new EMS center this afternoon. With Mr. Nick West, uh, any of the commissioners that hasn't looked at it and need to look at it, you'd be proud of what he is doing to upgrade the services for Columbus County citizens. I was very impressed, and we may have some more good news coming in another week that's going to impress everybody much more. But uh, appreciate you, Mr. Nick. I want to let you know that. And uh, to uh, Chief Deputy McMillan and to Sheriff Bill Rogers, thank you for what you're doing, getting that grant money back, because we did need it. Thank you, sir. I'm through. Commissioner, right. I mean, uh, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Uh, Ms. Jacobs covered this already, uh, but I did want to, again, remind you of your uh, calendar um, requirements. One is the 27th of February, where we'll be meeting with the community college representatives and Whiteville City Schools uh, Board uh, and Superintendent, uh, followed by March 8th, your budget retreat uh, that will be held here. On the 14th, we will be meeting with the Columbus County School Board to discuss their budget needs. Uh, immediately following this meeting, I will be driving to Surrey County, uh, North Carolina for a meeting that starts in the morning. It's a meeting that has been scheduled in collaboration with the school systems the hospital and the community college to talk about uh, the apprenticeship program that has been very successful at Surrey and we're hoping to bring uh, here to Columbus County in the very near future. <laughs> so as soon as this meeting wraps up, I'll be jumping in a car and heading to Surrey County. Uh, I also want to remind you of the Tabor City Chamber of Commerce annual meeting that's tomorrow evening. Uh, hopefully you will have a opportunity to attend that. This Thursday, the annual COG banquet 
If you've not RSVP'd uh, to Miss Neely, please do that uh, if you can by tomorrow. You'll notice the climate in this room is a little more regulated thanks to the good work of our facilities uh, department and prison um, uh, contractors. Uh, the HV HVAC system was put in service last week. I think my weeks are not running together, not so bad, but I think last week that those units were put into service and the building's now uh, operating as normal. <clears throat> we do want to extend our condolences to the Watts family. Mr. Banks Watts passed away uh, last week and his services were held today. Uh, that's the reason why Mr. Watts is not with you this evening. We have a blood drive coming up on March 16th. Uh, we encourage uh, all of our employees, the board and the general public to take part in that. It's from 10 to 12, excuse me, 10 to two. Uh, located at the uh, branch building here on Madison Street on our campus. Uh, last time we were together, you heard me mention the healing place. I'll reiterate that tonight. Uh, there is a substance abuse hotline that's on um, online now. That number is 910-640-8872. 910-640-8872. And that's available for anyone who's seeking treatment uh, due to opioid addiction uh, and other services. Uh, currently, we have eight Columbus County citizens that are, are receiving care and treatment uh, at the Healing Place at this point. Uh, so we're very pleased with that. I uh, want to reiterate, I know uh, our uh, DSS director, uh, made some mention of, of one item that's of importance uh, legislatively, but I want to reiterate that and two others. Uh, the first being Medicaid expansion. Uh, it was long anticipated. It will make an impact on the community, especially the medical community, the hospital systems and the other providers. Uh, by expanding the numbers of individuals who qualify for Medicaid assistance. What, what you also need to know is that uh, our DSS offices are already under considerable strain. We have, uh, at least as of last week, 23 openings in the department. And uh, with the expansion of their client base, it will put even greater strain on that department. So I know uh, our director would greatly encourage those who are interested in a career in social services to apply. Uh, and especially as we prepare to roll out uh, the services through the expansion uh, that we think will be approved very shortly. In fact, we understand uh, that there's an incentive for the program to go into effect by July 1st. And so things could move very, very quickly in the next couple of weeks, if not months. Uh, the other two is House Bill 105. You might want to pay note of that. Uh, House Bill 105 is a property tax um, deferment program that's been introduced on the House floor. Uh, it has not gained traction yet, but it is something we need to be keeping our eye on. The Association of County Commissioners certainly is or um, the uh, program sounds great in concept, but it has ramifications to us locally. So the program, if adopted and signed into law, would cap the amount of property taxes but for persons above the age of 65, sounds great in concept, right? But when 25% of your population is in that age category, it has an impact on the revenues of the county. Uh, and that is without regard to um, income level. So the current uh, law caps it uh, based on an annual household income, I think, of $34,000. Uh, this bill, if approved, would have no cap and would apply to any individual or family uh, where the uh, members are, or the, the owners of that property are uh, 65 years of age or greater. Uh, the last one is House Bill 122, uh, which is of grave concern to us. Uh, you heard our finance director talk about the UAL, the unit assistance list. We are on that because of prior findings in our audit, correct? Not recent findings, but prior years, we find ourselves on that list. Uh, the LGC has said that we should be coming off that list, that we're doing all the right things to come off the UAL. The problem with House Bill 122 is that the 
uh, this bill would require the withholding of sales tax revenues to cities and counties that are on the UAL. So you're taking a bad situation and making it worse by withholding revenues that we depend on. So if you get a chance to speak with your legislat legislators or call the Association of County Commissioners, please make mention of those three items and how they impact uh, the operations of county government. And then lastly, uh, you all have signed up, but I want to remind you of the economic development training um, with our staff uh, this Wednesday at 8.30. And that concludes my report. Could you have a letter typed up with each commissioner to sign it for House Bill 122? Ask them not to do it. Yes, sir. Can you support it? Yes, sir. Okay. All right, so we do have a, tr I'm sorry, but um, Mr. West just reminded me that you have an actor, active assailant training exercise this coming Saturday at East Columbus. Yes. And so that, that may involve some activity and a flurry of events uh, there at the high school, but it is a training exercise only. Um, not to be um, not to be uh, confused with an actual active shooter environment. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. Anything else? If nothing else, we have a motion to adjourn. So moved. Motion by Commissioner Bird. Second by Commissioner Coleman. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carried. I won't be able to be here Wednesday morning. I got to talk to you. I can't be here.